Um, so when we had gone to Israel, it was really, it was really a blessing. Um, oh, sorry, Joan. <laughs> It was really a blessing because um, it allows you to really see the Bible in motion. Um, you don't have to imagine where things happened. You can remember where they happened. And that was the biggest takeaway for me is that um, when I read the Bible, I'm always thinking like that Jesus is having all these um, like these parables and these examples and you know they're just kind of like far off things that he thought about but they're not they're places that he walked he's talking about things that he knew about and i didn't understand that until i was on the ground the terrain he's talking about the journeys that he's talking about you see the distance and those things mean so much like when your feet are standing in the place where there where miracles happened you don't have to imagine when you read your Bible what that must have been like. And I think I must have taken over a thousand pictures. <laughs> like, But not you cannot take enough pictures to capture what it means or what the significance of that place. And so that was something really, really special to me. Um, I, I can't... like. I can't explain enough. They they took us to places and they gave us dates and carbon dating and talked about rocks and all this, you know, cool stuff. But at the end of the day, like you can tell me 1700 years ago or 2000 or 3000 years ago, it doesn't really mean I can't compute that. But what I know is the feeling that I feel standing on the steps where Jesus stood. When you see the Sea of Galilee and how windy it was when we were there, you understand what it must have been like to be on that sea in a boat scared for your life and then the calm that jesus can bring because you see it in the two states and it's just like wow like it's mind-blowing so i i encourage you guys to make the pilgrimage if and when you can and like they're finding things all the time. So <laughs> if you go next year, it might be a whole different tour. You might find, you know, I'm sure there was, they were, they were doing, we saw at least four excavations while we were there. So they're still finding, they're still learning, they're still developing. And so um, there will always be something to see and something to learn. So if and when you can make the pilgrimage, it is such such a good thing for your soul such a good thing for your understanding of the word um because when you're there you really really see that the word is alive it is hi she said so much i don't know what to say now <laughs> right but it was a great experience and i i it's something that i'll always cherish and when you see them the loads of people in different uh, on bus tours from all different countries and they're all thinking the same way they want to know God and walk in his footsteps it's just incredible um, all I can say is go if you have a chance right I was contemplating should I go should I go and I'm so glad I did it's just really I don't know I can't explain it it was. Thank you. Thank you, Debra. And that's just, again, only a glimpse, a nutshell of the experience of being there. Um, I, and I encourage all of you, when you can, even if it's only once, that's really tall, even if it's <laughs> once that you are able to go, go. You know, go with an open heart, go with uh, a Bible, and, and just say, God, teach me. What, what do you want to teach me today by being in, in, the, in this location? Um, one of the coolest things I remember um, that our, what happened? I don't want to stay up there, right? I lose focus. Trust me. It, this way, even if you're sleeping, I can be engaged and get you awake. <laughs> um, but one of the uh, cool things is, if you notice some of the places, that I, or one of the places is Tel Hazor. There's also Tel Dan, so T-E-L, -E not T-E-L-L. -L. 
Um, though Tel Aviv doesn't mean anything actually when it comes to Tel. Um, and so when it comes to the word Tel, uh, Tel Hazor, Tel Dan, uh, and many other Tels, it means not one civilization, but multiple civilizations that they found just by digging. And one of the oldest I think they found was 21 civilizations that they dug out. You know why? Because like Israel's there, then one kingdom come, destroy that stuff, then build on top of them, then another kingdom comes, destroy that, build on top, on top, on top, on top, and then they just find. So they have to keep digging till they find Israel and then the Byzantine and the Ottoman Empire and all of the empires that came after. And so it was so cool to be there. And then it, now it makes sense with all these wars and things that the Bible talks about. And so now when you go back and read the Old Testament, you have a picture in mind. And it, again, I could talk so much more. And the second thing that really caught our attention was when we had the Shabbat meal in, at a Jew, Jewish home. And, and uh, so a, a Jewish family hosted us. And so we sat around and then they went through what they would usually do in a Shabbat. No cell phones. I mean, I know there was like no, cook, uh, no cooking. Everything was already prepared. But the, the thing that came out of it, and I think us Christians haven't learned yet, is to pause even for one day. And then the, the man, the head of the house, blesses the family, blesses the food, blesses his wife, sings uh, a song to his wife in front of his family. And there's this sense of stillness that comes and says, you know, for one day, we're not working. We're not even looking at our cell phones. We were not even allowed to take pictures there. Others, you would see pictures up there. For us, lunchtime, Facebook, who's, who's liked my picture so far? Who has texted me? And to really realize the importance of stillness and getting attention back on God. So it was really cool. And we had an amazing meal uh, at the Shabbat meal. So... Uh, guys, take advantage. Take advantage and, and go. When you have a chance, go. I'm, I'm praying and I'm and Lord willing uh, next year if I can find the right organization again um, and another tour guide. It, it, it could be the same, but I'm hoping for because every organization and tour guide is a different experience. Last year was a different experience and I thought it would be the same this year. Nope, completely different. And I learned even more. So every year will be different. So Keep your ears open. Lord willing, I'll find something. And I'll say, Shiloh, let's save your money. <laughs> All the dollars and pennies that you can save. And, and let's go together and let's study together. And let it be a study tour, right? So again, uh, March 23rd, there will be, uh, Lord willing, March 23rd, uh, for two or three hours, we'll have someone from Bridges for Peace to come talk about Israel, the history, and the reason why it's important for Israel now to be that nation. All right, church, you ready? Amen. So it's been a couple of weeks. And uh, so I, again, I, I start slow all the time because I need to build a proper foundation. But I want to say, God, I want to thank you. You're here. I want to thank you that you want to speak into our hearts. You want to teach us. You want to transform us, not just give us information. You want to bring transformation in our lives. So we take our eyes off of people, take our eyes off of our circumstances, and we fix our eyes on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, may I honor you through the preaching of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Some cannot even look at their wives. <laughs> neighbor, what's behind your eye? What's behind your eye? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Luke chapter 11. Oh, man, this thing's crackling a lot. Luke chapter 11, 33 to, th through, uh, to 36. Luke chapter 11. So we're going we're gonna to read a couple of different other versions. The reason I do that is because, you know, the... For any of us that are diehard King James Version people, just try reading different versions as well because it will help you understand. I like what John Abelson said. When the Bible was uh, written, uh, not in English, but in Greek and Hebrew, it was written in street language for a common person to understand it. We took the Bible and elevated it to something that no one can understand. 
So we want to bring it down to what we can understand. So let's read this together. All right. No one, when he has lit a candle, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a candlestick that those who come in may what? All right. So that beautiful song, this little lad of mine, right? So keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, next verse. The eye is the lamp of the body. So when Jesus was saying, was talking about the lamp or the light or whatever, he's talking about your eye. So when people look in your eye, they should see light. All right? So I, I'm just making fun here. You know, oftentimes we have those really dark sunglasses that you can't even see who you're talking to. But perhaps if you take those glasses out and your transparency reflects Jesus, imagine what people can see. All right? So the eye is the lamp of the, of the body. All right? Therefore, where your, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of... Okay, it's not talking about just preaching. It's not just talking about the, you know, playing music or anything. It's talk about you. So when people look into your eye, they got to see light. So that's when the song, this little light of mine, this little light right here. I'm going to let it. All right. How little are your eyes? It's pretty little, right? But what is little can illuminate a big, big light of Jesus through you. So when people look at you, you are not going to be like, yes, Jesus. I, I did that one time. I was trying to share the gospel to someone. And my eyes was down, and he said, look, he looked, I, this is, I was so embarrassed. He looked at me and said, dude, you don't even look convinced about the gospel you're trying to preach. And I was like, oh. So then I tried to correct my eye and look at him, and I could just tell it was too late. You know, I already ruined that opportunity. We make mistakes. So, you know, <laughs> you know, how many times have people said, hey, when you converse eye to eye, right? Eye to eye. Why? Because the eye reveals a lot of things. Okay? So, but when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Keep going. Take heed, therefore, lest the light which is in you is darkness. Keep going. If your whole body then is full of light, no part being dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the shining candle gives you light. I think I have one more verse there. No, okay, go to the version now. Uh, the next version, please. You have the New Living Translation. No, okay. Okay. No one lights a lamp and then hides it and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. Keep going. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is, say it out loud. Your whole body is filled with, but when it is unhealthy, your body is filled with darkness. Keep going. Make sure that the light you think you have, say this out loud. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually. Woo Man, now some of us got to check what we believe about God. Amen. Here's Jesus challenging. It's like, hey, what you believe about me, what you confess about me, make sure that that quote-unquote light is not really darkness. He's not talking about sin. He's not talking about what, you know anything wrong. He's talking about what do you believe, the core belief of your heart. And oftentimes, can we switch to the next version, uh, Dario? The, the passion. I, I love the way the passion puts it. Okay, no one think. Just next verse, please. Next verse. The eyes of your spirit allow revelation light to enter into your. Okay? To enter into your being. When your heart is open, the light floods. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Right? The song. See, when, man, some of these songs come into my heart when I start reading it in different versions. I said, God, now I want to sing this song with meaning because I want my eyes to open, Lord. All right? When your heart is open, the light floods in. When your heart is hard and closed, the light cannot penetrate and darkness, what? 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, right? Man, let that be your prayer. God, open my eyes because I don't want to be blind. Next verse, look at this. Open your heart and consider my words. Watch out that you do not mistake, say this out loud, your opinions for revelation. Hey, if this hit me home this week, and I, I will preach from what I learned in my prayer room. Trust me. I'm not going to try and prepare a sermon to make things look good. I'm going to prepare what Jesus teaches me in my prayer time. Because then it's real. Then my heart is real to you. And I'm not faking this. But it says, watch out that you do not mistake your opinions for revelation. Like now the question is, what is your opinion and what is his opinion? Wow. Isn't that incredible, church? Listen, you can read the Bible for the sake of history. You could. You know, our, our, our tour guide is a secular Jew. Lots of knowledge. Quoting scripture was a bam, 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 bam. And I'm like, but how did, does he not know Jesus as his personal Savior? Because you can take the Bible and read it for the sake of history. You can take the Bible and read it to prove your point. You can take the Bible and read it for archaeology. Eh? You can read your Bible for the sake of having fun stories. But it will not transform you until you crack open that Bible and say, God, show me, change me. Transform me, make me more like you as I read your word. Because those who know God from his word with the help of the Holy Spirit is transformed. Because you don't read for information, you read for transformation. Amen, church. So we can read the Bible for the sake of getting a lot of information. You can read a lot. Of, there's tons of Bible. Tons of commentaries, tons of books out there, encyclopedia, anything you can read. But it'll all end up right here. I won't do anything here. When you read the scripture for transformation, and let me encourage you, read it with the Holy Spirit. Because when He is with you, He's always with you. But when you invite Him to teach you, oh man... You'll say, Pastor, I just learned that last week. Pastor, I just learned that two weeks ago. Thank you. You know why? Because the Spirit is not doing His work. So this week, here's the challenge. Open your Bible and say, Holy Spirit, teach me about God because I don't know a single thing. I don't know a single thing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And it's cool when you read in a different uh, version. It just opens and opens and opens your understanding even, even a lot more. First Corinthians chapter 2. I think I gave you the wrong... I did. I gave you 12 instead of 2. Yeah, I gave you the wrong... I'm going slow here. Okay, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation right now. Or uh, New Living. I'll give Dario a chance to uh, load that up. If you're able to find New Living, if not, go to NIV. Just go to NIV, First Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go to NIV. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you. So now he's talking about when I first started to build this church, he was, Paul was talking to Corinthians. I said, I came with you with the simplicity of the gospel. Because why? He said, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith 
might not rest on human or men's what wisdom but on God's power all right Bible says the gospel is the power of God so again he's saying I'm not here because he was trained I'm under the top philosopher of his day he could have come with the most amazing speech but he said I don't want you to depend on man's wisdom I want you to depend on the power of God and God's wisdom is his power Amen. Okay, let's keep going. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. So, you know, among the mature uh, Christians, he said, we do speak wisdom, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. All right, let's go down to verse 10. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of... Is it, are we there? Read out loud. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Church, if we tap on to the Holy Spirit who has been a deposit into our lives. So when we go to Him, we receive, we understand what He's given us. Amen? I was talking to a friend earlier this week, and, and she said, man, I've been having dreams, and I realized something God's been teaching her. It's like, she saw a lot of Christians sitting in one place, but doing nothing. And she's like, God, what does it mean? Then another day saw the same dream, but the Christians with a lot of tools in their hands, we're doing nothing and God's like my body my church has been given everything but doing nothing with it and this is someone from California who called me and said I just want to share this message with you Bob and so that's why we have a lot of equipping seminars happening amen so that you know how to put things into practice okay look at this this is what we speak not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-thought words. Okay, now look at, look at verse 16. Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have what? The mind of... Okay? If we believe that we, and we know that we have the mind of Christ, the light in our eyes should be what? Revelation light, Jesus Christ. Okay. So now I'm talking to believers, am I? Am I talking to those that love Christ and know Christ? All right? It's time that we let go of our opinion and say, God, what is revelation light? What, who are you? Who are you, my Lord, that I can know you even more? Because, see, we can default into our own opinions and think it is a Christian opinion. But when in fact, Jesus looks at it and says, that is darkness, and your whole body is filled with it. Okay? Now look at this. Look at Matthew. Or, or, or Mark there. Mark chapter 12, 12 uh, 30 to 31. Awesome scripture. We, we know this. Okay? A scribe. Someone from the law came to Jesus and said, Well, tell me about uh, what's the greatest commandment. And look what Jesus said. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Keep going. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus didn't add there. It was already in the law. He's saying to love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. How many of you can agree with that? All right. Love your neighbor and love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as your... Okay? Here's the thing. And being in Israel really, really got my attention. Because we, when we read scripture, sometimes we read the Bible from a Western perspective, which is flawed. Man, when I realized that, I started to buy books on the, the cultural background of the Bible, what, 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 is, what is a Jewish person will think, like I, I went to town, I was in Israel and I bought two books based on that too. 
Because when you read this Bible from a Western mindset, it sounds good from a what? A Western perspective. But when you look at it, what Jesus was really talking about, Jesus was talking to someone in the law. Someone of the law, a Pharisee, a scribe, and, and he's saying, Oh yeah, the great, two greatest commandments, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you know that some of us don't even love ourselves enough to love others? Hello. And how many of you know, even loving God, you failed loving God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. You failed in it. I am one of them. We all are. Amen? Do you hear what I'm saying, church? So here, Jesus was, was not say, giving us this, this thousands of years of, of, of command saying, oh, you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. Let me tell you, there's a lot of self-help, self-love, self-this, self-that books out there. I said, God, what is the difference between that and you saying this? Am I talking to failures today? Who have failed Love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, there, there's a thing uh, I also learned in Israel. When the Jewish people, because of, of, of Scripture was like that, even when they pray, they're like this. Why? You should love you, the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. So everything is an effort to love God. Everything is an effort to love your neighbor. And sometimes loving your neighbor is a challenge. Wow. Yes. And amen. Do you see why I started slow? Because that foundation is important. Because our opinions sometimes limit us to understand what love truly is. What love truly is. So here Jesus says, this is the commandment. But remember, Jesus did not die yet. This was before his death, before he was crucified, before he shed his blood, before his resurrection. It was after he came, died, was buried, and resurrected. Then the new covenant. So here is the standard. First John chapter 3. Okay? First John, sorry, chapter 4, I mean. First John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God, and what? So what is love now? It's not about love with all your mind, your whole, your strength and everything or love, love your neighbor as yourself. What is it saying? Love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and he knows. So love starts with God and ends with God. It doesn't start with your strength. It doesn't start with loving yourself. It starts with how much He loves you and how much you know He loves your brother and sister. Church, the standard of love is not based on your effort. The standard of love is based on His effort for you. Can I get an amen, church? Because, see, we have limited love to our efforts. And then we have people want to learn how to love themselves and love themselves so that they can love. Look, it's a good commandment. Oh man, that was a workout. <laughs> but when the standard, and I'm not talking about standard as something you've got to work towards. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about loving God and loving your neighbor and loving your enemies Based on how much he loves you and based on how much he loves your neighbor and your enemies. Let's keep reading this. Keep going. Anyone who does not love does not know. He does not say he does not know himself. He does not know. For God is love. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live what? We're not living for ourselves. We're living through Him. Next verse. Oh, and blank. Okay, go. If you have another version, feel free. <laughs> verse 16, I believe. Are you guys enjoying this? Man, I tell you, I, I, I started this year with the teaching on the kingdom of God and it's just transforming my mind and my heart to, to realize, man, the kingdom of God is bigger than what we call ourselves church. 
Woo! Is it there? 16? It should be. Soon, soon and very soon. Going to see the king. Oh, why not? Soon and very soon. <laughs> soon and very soon. We are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the king. You know, when I sing that song right now, I like to say it as going to see the king now. Not going to heaven right now. Okay, let me read 16. And we know and rely on the love of on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. How many of you know that your love in your own effort is not perfect. Hey, hey. <laughs> but it is the love of Jesus that is perfect. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. It means the one who lives in fear is not made perfect in Christ. Why? Because God is love. We love because He first not because of your merit, not because how much strength you had to love your neighbor. We love because what? He first loved us. The standard, the level of love is now based upon Him. So if you have a question about love, you look at God, not at me, not at your neighbor, not at your brother, not at your sister. I remember walking around Bible college being disappointed with my friends and, my, and one buddy of mine put his arms around me and said, what's wrong? I said, oh, I looked at, I was looking up to this guy and then I saw something he did and now that discouraged me. And then I saw someone else and he discouraged me and he's like, Bob, your eyes is on God, not on man. Then you will not be as disappointed as you are right now. I didn't want to listen to him then because I wanted to just complain and say, his fault, her fault, this person's fault. Easy to do. But in Christ... When we look at people to the eyes of Jesus, flaw or not, doesn't matter. Your love will still penetrate. Amen? Okay, let me finish this here. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and... Isn't that amazing, church? So now it's not love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord because he first loved you. Love your brother and sister because he first loved you. Isn't that incredible? Now let's take that opinion that we have of ourselves and of others and bury it at the foot of the cross. And say, God, teach me how to love the way you love me. You know, when I look at my son, yeah, I can think of all the flaws my dad had in loving me. I could, I could make a list and say, oh, look at all the wrong things he did. I will never do this again. And the only thing to find out, everything that I said I will never do, I end up doing. How many parents know what I'm talking about? It's because we are trusting on our own efforts. And there were times I went on my knees as God, I do not know how to parent Canaan right now. I'm ready to bang my head against the wall. <laughs> Seriously, I have. Some of you parents know what I'm talking about. But then I saw his grace come in and take full control of the situation and settle my son down and settle me down too. <laughs> and say, this is love. Not based on your effort, Bob. Not based on you. Not based on 
did I pray for two hours, now I receive God? No. It's a, it is based on how much God loves me and my son and my wife and my, and my coming child. Everything is surrounded on His love alone. One last point here. Love doesn't mean compromise. You hear me? See, that's the world's opinion. Well, if you love me, you'll accept who I am and how, how I behave. I love what John Alberston said. What you tolerate becomes your standard. Do you understand what I'm saying? What you tolerate, it becomes your standard. If you tolerate sin, that has just become your standard. If you tolerate gossip, that has become your standard. If you tolerate hating one another, that has become your standard. And how do you discern what is right and what is wrong? You go back to scripture and you see the love of God. It says, God, I want that to be my standard. And the way when I read scripture, Jesus didn't go about saying, I'll do whatever you want. He actually went and said, go and sin no more. You are not condemned because you've come and repented. Go and sin no more. You want to know how to get rid of sin? Just change your thinking. That's it. That's what repentance means. To change your mind. Change the way you think. Some of us have tolerated sin in our lives for a very long time. And you've tried for so many years in your own effort to change it. And you constantly failed and failed and failed and failed and failed. But today, Abba Father is looking and saying, why don't you just come to me and I'll take care of everything. I'll take care of everything. Let's pray. God loves you so much. The standard of love is not based on your effort or your strength, how much merit. It's going to be based on Jesus and His love. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Life abundantly, life free from sin, life in the fullness and the joy of God. How many of you want to be filled with the joy of God today? I'm not, I'm not talking about finding a bottle that will keep you happy or some kind of a substance to keep you happy or even trying to be a bubbly person because you're just trying to be happy no, I'm talking about depending on God today if that is your choice I'm talking to both believers and non-believers Christians and non-Christians saying God I have tried to follow you on my own effort but today I want to fall into your arms I want to fall into your arms like I would fall on top of a bed if that is you just every eye close just a quick hand raise and put down see your hand 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 I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Sing that chorus one more time. I surrender all. I surrender all, 
I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Okay, let's stand. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for sharing your love to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. God, if there's anyone here who said, Lord, I surrender, I thank you that right now they are a family of God and they have received the Holy Spirit by which they can cry out and say, Abba, Father. Lord, for those that have reached the end of their rope and said, I give up, I am tired, I'm exhausted. And today they said, Lord, but I surrender. I thank you for the spirit of life that rests upon them and will strengthen them right now in Jesus' name. Will breathe life into their circumstance and transform them for the glory of God. That they will walk and learn in the true image of God given to them that is rightfully theirs where the enemy tried to take it and twist it God says no I come to restore your original identity Lord anyone struggling in their walk with you I pray that this coming week they will find joy and relief and release in your presence songs will come out of them songs of deliverance songs of love songs of hope They'll be just walking down the street or in the mall and they'll be singing songs of hope because Jesus is King and Jesus is alive. Today, Father, we rest in your love. We throw ourselves into your love. Lord, we give up making an effort to love you and to love, oursel and to love ourselves and to love our neighbor, but today we want to know how much you love us and how much you love this world. We rest in that today, Father. Thank you. We love you. Receive the glory, Father. Bless your people today, Father. As they go, let them experience the peace, the presence, the joy, the freedom, the breath of life that they've been looking forward to. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I love you, and God loves you even more. Amen. Bless you.